Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Courtside with Beal and some Tennis, part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. The round of 16 is set. We wanted to record this purposely at this time before the first of the round of 16 matches start. Uh, to timestamp it, we are Saturday afternoon at 2 o'clock Eastern time. Of course, I have with me my co-host and Hall of Famer, Steve Flink. Steve, I'll start with a couple things and I'll let you kind of Go from there, and then we'll go into some of specifics. Iga, out. Robakina, out. Pagula, out. U.S. men, TFO, out. Shelton, out. Tommy Paul, out. Fritz is still in. And for the U.S. women, we have Coco Goff still alive and Amanda Anisimova still alive. A lot happened during the first week, as it always does in Slam, Steve. Absolutely. But I, I guess the one that stands out to me in a lot of ways was Iga. She was on an 18 match winning streak. These courts, I think, suit her game well. She had she she dealt with Kenan, Kenan which was a tough first round draw. She came from one four down in the third, won five games in a row to beat Collins. So I thought that was going to toughen her up and and make her even um, maybe even increase her chances to take the title. And instead she got toppled last night by a 19 year old in the Czech Republic, Linda Noskova, great performance from Noskova. But again, Iga had won the first set. She was a three all break point, second set, lost three games in a row. She was a three all game point in the third set, having broken back already and lost her serve again, had love 30 in the last game. Lot of, lot of missed opportunities, but I mean, taking nothing away from Noskova, who was very poised and mature and really going for her shots. But I was a bit surprised because I thought Iga was, she established a certain supremacy and in the women's game, ended the year winning the WTA year-end championships last year to, to cement number one in the world for the second year in a row. And she was on a roll. And uh, that one sort of stands out to me among the many that you mentioned. The second one, Tommy Paul. David we saw him get to the semis last year. We agreed, you and I agreed in the year-end summation that maybe Tommy was not going to quite be able to hold his ground. That, that you know, he had a terrific year. It was going to be hard just to say stay right where he was or, or to climb. But this was disappointing against Kaczmanovic because Tommy had two sets to one and then two t- match points in the four-set tiebreak and made pretty bad errors on both. One was a forehand in the net after he had, come off the defense and was in a neutral position, maybe even in an advantage in the rally. And the second was a very easy back in down the line that he hit about five feet long. And I, um, th- 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 and then you could see he was mentally and maybe, maybe a little physically handicapped in the fifth. We don't really know, but certainly mentally he was very down and he lost, he got blitz six love in the fifth. And I thought that was a shame, you know, because he would have earned himself the right to play Carlos. He had the two great matches with Carlos last summer. He split those on hard courts. He was in good position. It would have been a nice feeling for him to come back and take another crack at it with maybe Carlos still slightly vulnerable. I think Tommy would have had a, you know, I wouldn't have made him the favorite in that match, but he wouldn't have been uh, at a great disadvantage either. I think he would have been right in there. And and maybe that was playing on his mind, but the match really got away from him. It was a shame. The one thing if Peksmanovic, was just too good on those big match points and beat him with great shot making, but that was not the case. I think Tommy, to be frank, I think he choked in that tie break. And then I think he couldn't get over it in the fifth. I think it was really weighing on his mind and, and he just, he could never regroup too bad. Yeah. I think you're spot on with your analysis there and Tommy, and we've talked about this before, not only with Tommy, but with the other Americans, um, for them to make that jump into the elite, elite area, you got to just be more consistent. And those are types of matches that you have to win because, you know, it's not getting easier as you go through the latter parts of these rounds at slams. And those are matches that you just have to win. And it's, you know, there's only four of these each year, Steve. There's only four of these each year. You could say the same thing about Francis Tiafo, right? These are um These are times where you make your name as a legacy in the sport and each lost opportunity hurts. Now that's saying they're still very young and they get it right. There's still plenty of tennis. They still have a lot of opportunities, but for them to get to where they want to be, those types of matches, you have to just get through. Yeah. Especially when you have, when you create those kinds of opportunities, it's one thing if you just had a terrible night and lost in straight, just played a bad match and, you just say, I just wasn't good enough tonight. But he, 
lost the first set and really took command in the next two sets. And then Kexmanovic raised his level in the fourth to be sure, but Tommy gave himself that opportunity, got into that tie break, had the match points, one on his serve, one on the other guy's serve. And he was in both points and gave them away. That, that, that's something that you, that, that can haunt you. And I mean, granted, he was protecting semifinal points from a year ago where he lost to Novak in the semis. But I think had he won this match, he would really have enjoyed playing Carlos. I don't think he would have been thinking, God, I got to win this and protect my points. It would have been, wow, this is an opportunity. I could, I, I know I have it in me to beat Carlos and I'm going to give it everything I have. And, and perhaps that would, those thoughts were kind of spinning through his mind uh, when he, when he had, I mean, he really wanted to earn that appointment, but he didn't. I do want to, um, <clears throat> before we look ahead at some of these matchups and it's going to be fun to, for, for the both of us to discuss it. Um, I do want to also mention 16 year old Mira Andre, but she wins her first round Her second round. She plays on Jabor, Steve. And we were just, shocked i mean yeah we all thought ons would win but even if ons didn't win you look at the score there steve six love six two and you, you know you give andreva all credit in the world right um but you just hope ons is is okay whether it was something physical or mental i know she's been going through a lot you don't expect ons to lose a match like that six oh six two and then to compound that, Andreva in her next match, she's what? She's down 1-5 in the third, 2-5 in the third with some match points. She gets through that. She wins that match as well. She's still alive. And uh, she plays she plays Krejcikova. She's got an opportunity to beat, to, to, to win that match as well. No, her maturity. I, I watched her win that next match against Perry, I believe you pronounce it. And that I thought that was re remarkable. The way you could see that as soon as she, even as soon as she got back to two five, then she saves the match point at, at in the five two game. You could just see her, her. Uh, you, you could sort of, you could read her mind. You could sense that she thought to herself, you know what, this is not over. I can win this match. I'm taking it a point at a time. She really raised her level considerably, and uh, and then eventually won it in the tie break in the third. So I. That's impressive to me to follow up on the big win over Ons, and then you play somebody you're kind of you're expected to beat, and the match is nearly out of reach, and you pull it out from one five in the third. That's a champion. All right, before we before we head into the matchups, I want to uh, uh, have one more thought before we dive into this. Nick Kyrgios, the the I love the hoodies, I love the work attire in the commentator box. I don't know if that's really. Uh, what ESPN had in mind when they had him in there, but he's doing great. I think, I mean, I know he's having fun. Um, I think the commentators, uh, at least from what they've shown publicly, are enjoying uh, hanging out with him, calling matches with him. He's he's done a good job. Even when he did Tennis Channel a few months ago, I thought it was very interesting, and he did a good job. He got his feet wet when he did the Tennis Channel stuff. Now he's very comfortable. What I like about him, David, is he's very deferential to his fellow commentators doesn't try to act like he knows it all. If they say, if, if a Chris Fowler or somebody else says something that he thinks is insightful, he, he says, you're spot on. And he, he's insightful. He's very good at reading serving patterns. I think he's going to go with a kick serve wide. He's going to go with, he's going to go wide in the deuce core right now. And I think he'll follow it in. He, he's, he's usually right about those types of things. And the other thing that's great about him is he's just positive for the most part, very positive. You would think he would have maybe an edge to him and be, and be a little hypercritical of other players. It's exactly the opposite. So I've enjoyed listening to him. And he seems to work well, whether he works with John McEnroe or Chris Fowler, whoever it is, he seems very comfortable. Yeah, he does seem very comfortable. And I, I agree with you. The negativity that he may have or a chip on his shoulder against a certain player or whatever, it's just not, he's just not showing it. And that's great that he's oh. not. It's, it's very no, positive, it's not. insightful, it's and, and very well yep. done. It's the opposite because he he goes out of his way, but without forcing it, to be nice to those people, and and then it, then that ends up coming back to him. It's it's been enjoyable to listen to him, and I'm I'm looking forward to the rest of the way. And he speaks his mind, he makes his predictions. He's he's he he, he doesn't have any hesitation about that either. He's done a nice job. Yeah, and then also has. we got Chris Eubanks. Chris Eubanks came into the into the booth to do the uh, Med Medvedev uh, FAA match, and it was nice to see hear him after. Uh, after he exited the tournament. He's always enjoyable to, it's always nice to hear his commentary. And he's also very insightful. Yes, Chris does a great job. We, everyone enjoys listening to him as well. Okay, round of 16 matches. Um, let's start with the the men, the top half 
um, of that, Steve, is loaded. Um, the first one you'll have Novak against uh, Manorino. And Manorino, I mean, a very, very uh, entertaining person to watch. He beat Ben Shelton in a long, uh, physical, played-out match. Manorino's one of those guys, Steve. I've joked about it for, for a couple of years now. It's like you go to your local park. He comes with a T-shirt with maybe one racket and a little water bottle, and you don't think he's anything. And in 45 minutes, you're off the court losing 6-0, to him. <laughs> he is really, really difficult to play. Djokovic, I think, will get through that match. Four sets, maybe. But um, I fully expect Novak to get through that. But Manorino's a tricky opponent to play. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Left-hander, and you know he hits the ball very flat, and he's not—he's not a powerhouse, but he can generate some pace when he needs to. He returns well. He does everything well. Very guileful player. Yeah, listen. If I kind of think I, I'm leaning toward Novak in straight because I believe that Manorino coming off three five setters in a row at age 35—that's an awful lot to ask of himself. He's capable of taking a set. But I think if Djokovic plays the way he did in the last round against Echeverry, where he finally won a straight set match, his first one of the tournament, 3-3-6, three, three, and six, that it's more likely that maybe there's one tough set that but Djokovic wins in straight would be my guess. But great tournament for Manorino. And if he's physically able to hang in there tonight, it's, just, it's an astonishing effort because though the, even the match with Ben David, that was a very physical match. Yeah. Manorino played it on his terms. He made Ben rally with him. There, I, I had a lot of some of my fr friends, in, including a very astute analyst I know named Mike Hart. They they complained, as did Brad Gilbert, that Ben should have been serving bigger. Where were the one forties? Why was he take? You know, too often he was going for the wide slice, and and why didn't he really let loose with the bombs? Uh, people sometimes criticize him, but on the other hand, John McEnroe pointed out that. He asked him, it sounds like he discussed that with Ben at Labor Cup last year, and that Ben said his arm can get sore if he serves too big too often. And he did have that black band on his arm. I don't know if that it, it, to protect him or whether it actually was sore. But I think that that did definitely hurt him in that match. But on the other hand, Manorino was so smart, and he, and he made Ben really play long, strenuous rallies. What I liked from Shelton's standpoint was he hung in there pretty well. He did pretty well from the baseline baseline game to me has improved immensely since even the u.s open so that was a good sign but in the end manorino who served for a two sets to one lead in that match and didn't close out that set and went down two sets to one he still was a very worthy five set winner i'll be interested to see how hard he can work novak but in the end again i would i would look for Djokovic and straight you you say four but it, it'll be fun to watch and Novak, this is when second week of slam, Novak is going to lock in, right? And this is where he can just become deadly and almost like machine-like. So it'll be interesting to to see uh, how locked in Novak is tonight and the rest of the tournament going yeah, forward David, if he gets through. Yeah, just to, to follow on that, he, he was closer to that, what you just described, <laughs> closer against Echeverry. Two really good sets. Couldn't break him in the third, but played an excellent tie break, which he won 7-2 and closed it out with a pair of aces. And he, 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 he looked a lot more comfortable and he seemed to be more, uh, the, whatever was going on with the wrist or also this virus that he's been battling, he just looked more comfortable out there and was unleashing the forehand more. And again, I think he's going to be looking to do that to Manorino too, to look for those openings to end points with winners, which he's fully capable of doing. And that not let Manorino draw him into too many unnecessarily long exchanges. All right, so the winner of that match will play the winner of Taylor Fritz versus Stefano Tsitsipas. Tsitsipas plays very well at this tournament, has made the finals here previously. Um, Taylor is the lone American left now on the men's side. On the men's side, I, I, I think Tsitsipas wins this one in four. Interesting. I'm totally torn. First of all, the only thing I would say is I think it's going five one way or another. Because I think both guys have gotten some encouragement, David. They didn't come in, start the tournament that well. And Taylor looked like he might have turned his ankle in the first round, but he's gotten better. Sitsipas didn't play well in the first round, but he's gotten better and better in the last two rounds. And it's the history. It, the, the reason I think you're probably right in the end that I would lean just slightly toward a Sitsipas win is that he has a 3 1 edge on Taylor. He lost them the match last year in Monte Carlo, I guess, on the clay. But he won their previous three, including a five-setter here a few years ago. 
And it's his history at this tournament. Runner up to Novak last year. He's had wins over a bunch of semifinals, had wins over Federer and Nadal at this tournament, including a climb from two sets down against Rafa. Not many guys have done that to him. So he has so many good memories to draw on at this event. So maybe that helps. But on the other hand, I honestly think the reason I say it's five and that I only lean slightly to Stefanos is that I think Taylor believes that he goes out there pretty confident himself that his game on hard courts can give uh, Stefanos big problems. It's going to be a fun match to watch. And to reiterate what we were talking about earlier about the younger Americans who needed to get through those early round matches that they should be winning the, you know, the TFO bowing out early Tommy Paul losing last night after having two match points, you look at Fritz's draw, right? You have to, it's it's so hard to win, Steve. So you have to get through those matches. He'll have to beat Sitsipas, then possibly Novak, then maybe a uh, sinner just to get to the final. That's why you have to win those matches that you're supposed to win because it doesn't get easier in the latter stages. <laughs> Yeah, but what you're right. But what makes this interesting is that I don't. Th- I, I think you can make a case for either in the supposed to win category coming in. Yes, uh, you know, I mean, Fritz Stefanos has got a better history here. He's been ranked higher, you know. So technically, I guess you say he's the favorite. He's the seed that's supposed to face Novak in the quarters. But then you have Fritz, who's come off a couple of really good years, and who at this point. I, I don't think he's afraid of Stefano. So I, I, I think they both go out there fully believing they're going to win this match. But oh, also- yeah, yeah, yeah. Without a doubt. I'm just saying yeah. like the, the Tommy Paws and the Francis Tifos, you just got to keep yeah. winning those matches you're supposed to win to give yourself opportunities that Taylor is now facing. And he's only in the round of 16. It's brutal. If Taylor were to go and win this tournament, look at who he'd have to beat. It's incredible. Yeah. It is. It is. All right. But this one, this will be a hard fought and, 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 it could could come down to just a couple of crucial points. And I can't see it being anything less than four, but I expect it to be five. The next one, again, this top half is brutal. Uh, Yannick Sinner versus Karin Kachanov. I expect Sinner to win that. And the bottom one is Alex Demonar versus Andre Rublev. Demonar has been playing great. Uh, I'll go Sinner plays Rublev. That's what I'll go with. Well, I agree with you on Sinner. I might go for Demonor over uh, over Rublev. That that's another one that could go five. Demonor is in such good form. Rublev has really found, hit his stride now after a shaky first rounder, and he he he's come off an, an emphatic win over Korda, and he's like he's liking the way he's hitting the ball at this point. Obviously, he hits that brute force of his game versus Demonor's great all around ability, incredible movement around the court, solid as a rock from the baseline. So I think that one is very tight. I'm confident that Sinner beats Hatchinoff probably in four. I think might, maybe he finally loses a set. The Demonor Rublev, Rublev, I think, goes the distance, but I'm going to go for Demonor. I think that one goes the distance too. Yeah, that'll yeah. be a fun one to watch. The bottom half of the draw, still plenty of, of top players. It's just not as every single matchup is not as, um, I'd say, highlighted as the top half of the draw. The one person that I do want to talk about, Grigor Dimitrov. I mean, we talked about it in the last couple episodes. Been playing so well. He loses a tough one last night. That's unfortunate because um, he was playing so well. And I know he wanted to get a chance to get to the round of 16, play Medvedev. He doesn't. Um, tough one for Grigor. He played, yeah, he played the Portuguese Bo- guy, Borges, who surprised everybody. You know, formerly a great college player and going back to 2019 and finals at the NCAA championships. And, you know, he'd never done anything on this scale at all. Shout major. out college tennis. Shout out college tennis. Yeah. So he's the first guy from his country to get to the round of 16 here in Australia. Big win. But Grigor had won the first set. At this level, usually those guys, you know, whether it's best of three or best of five, are very good at closing matches from up a set. He wasn't able, he didn't, but he couldn't break them until the fourth set. Went all the way into the fourth set without breaking this guy. Then got the break, had the five, served for the fourth set, didn't close him. And then in the breaker, makes a comeback, gets up six, five and double faults on set point and, and loses the breaker. So it was heartbreaker for Grigor who didn't sort of, I think if he'd been able to close out the fourth, most likely he wins it in five. And he's been on such a good roll and ended last year so well, started this year so spectacularly and had so many people talking about him. And we we hoped he might end up playing Medvedev, which could have been a blockbuster. We're missing out on that, just like we're missing out on Tommy Paul versus Alcaraz. That's the way it goes. But uh, Grigor will bounce back. I have no doubt about that. It's just that 
too bad and he couldn't exploit and uh, exploit what has been such a good run for him some of the best tennis of his career so you felt like he probably wouldn't lose to anybody that he shouldn't lose to that it was going to take one of the best players to beat him and that even they were going to have their hands full trying to cope with him it just didn't work out that way so I think coming out of that bottom half, um, I'll go Medvedev will play Carlos in the semis. That'll be a U.S. Open semi rematch. I know we got Hubie Hercosh still still in that side. He may play Medvedev in the quarters. What do you what do you look in this bottom half? Yeah, I mean, I I see it pretty much the way you do, because I think that Carlos is good. I think Carlos might drop a set against Ketchmanovic, by the way, who's coming. It's such a lift when you win a five setter like that against Tommy and he knew how close he was to leaving the tournament and he's playing some pretty good tennis, but Carlos wins that match. And then probably, I don't know if he's going to play Zarev or, or Nori in the, in the quarters, hard to call, but I'd go with, with Sasha. But again, I think Carlos again, probably in four. And then, yes, I see the Medvedev matchup. I think that Herkosh, if Herkosh can earn a quarterfinal duel with Medvedev, it's a very close match, but I'd still like Daniel in close four, possibly five, because he is such a great server that he's, that's almost going to guarantee him a set in my view, but I don't see him winning it. So, yeah, we get the rematch. And I have to say at this point, if you ask me who wins that match right now, I still go with Carlos because he avenged that U.S. Open loss in the year-end championships. It was technically not a not a, not a meaningful match for Medvedev in the sense that he'd already qualified for the semis in the round robin, so he didn't have to beat Carlos. But on the other hand, you know, he's a, he's a key rival. You don't want to lose that match. And he lost it pretty convincingly in straight sets so i feel like carlos is kind of cocky against medvedev in the best possible way doesn't take him lightly but feels he's better so at this point i would predict that we're going to see alcaraz in the final gotcha okay let's go over to the women's side the top <laughs> the top half of the women's draw is completely wide open now especially with Iga losing last night i mean you look at the names on that top half of the draw um to me Victoria Azarenka has a wonderful opportunity to get out of that top half and into the final of the Australian Open, Steve. Yeah, I mean, yes, because we know her record. We know her reputation. Uh, we know what she's done at this tournament. I mean, she has so many things going for her. And I certainly think she will. She should beat Yastrzemska in her next match. Then she might have to play Navaska, you know, or Svitolina, or Svitolina. Yeah, yeah Svitolina or Naskova, you know, Naskova coming off the big win. And yeah, that's not going to be easy either way. Uh, but I think that, you know, on experience, you would think maybe Vika has, has a certain advantage. It's a wide open half of that draw. The highest seed that can make it on Iga's half is the number 12 seed. So, but uh, I, it, it's definitely an opportunity for Azarenka. I, but I'm a little bit, I'm cautiously optimistic. Let me put it that way. And then the bottom half that, I mean, you look at Coco's draw, right? Coco, she's, she should get to the semis, right? There's really not any name up there that really strikes fear uh, <laughs> in beating Coco on that side. The bottom half of that bottom draw, if that makes any sense, um, <laughs> is, is a little bit tighter. In my opinion, you got the 16 year old Mira Andreva, you got, she's going to play Barbara. Kretschkova, and then you have Amanda Anisimova versus Sabalenka. Um, Anisimova is a great story. I mean, she's been away for quite a while. She's coming back. I think Sabalenka, her pace and her power is just going to be a little bit too much for Anisimova. Um, I think Sabalenka gets through that. I hope Andrevo keeps keeps winning. I'd like to see her play Sabalenka. I think Sabalenka's power just gets her to the semi, and she will be playing Coco Goff in what was a U.S. Open final rematch in the semis of Australia. Yeah, it'll be interesting because obviously she had control of that Open final. She was up a set and Coco made a great comeback and, and beat her. And some of it, you felt like some of it was the pressure weighing on Sabalenka's shoulders and some of it was Coco's time had come and she was capping a, a magnificent summer by winning this tournament. I think they potentially, I agree with you that they should get through for a semifinal meeting. Uh I, I, I guess I, I I would give Coco the very slight edge if they meet. Very slight. Coco in three. Could even be 7-5 in the third. That kind of a match. 
And again, uh, with Iga being out and Rabakina being out, it has opened up this field for for quite a few. So it has, but 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 these two, you know, this would be obviously a battle. You know, uh, Sabalenka is the defending champion. Coco won the last Grand Slam event, so they both come in confident about their chances. They both know how to win majors. So I just I hope we get that because we're going to get something surprising on the other side. There's going to be some new faces. Nothing wrong with that, but the semifinal might, in some ways surpass the quality of the final in my view it might end up being a higher quality match so i i the round of 16 at slams is is one of my favorite i i you know I, i'm a big college basketball fan and i love the sweet 16 elite eight matchups even maybe more so than the final four in the national championship game just because you get a lot of heavyweights versus heavyweights yeah there's going to be upsets but there's still enough heavyweight matchups going in i'm really excited for the second week the next time we're going to speak, Steve, is we're going to have a winner on both sides. And, you know, I'm not picking I'm not picking the field. I'm picking Novak Djokovic. They asked Nick Kyrgios the same thing when the tournament started. Do you want the field or Novak? Kyrgios said Novak. I'm not stupid enough to take the field. I'm going with Novak. Uh, and then on the on the women's side. The winner of the Coco Sabalenka match is probably is going to be favored, right? Is oh, no be- doubt, no doubt. Uh, uh, do I go with who I want, or do I go with who I really think is going to win? Well, I think I would. Well, first of all, who do I'm going Coco? As I said, who who do you think wins the Sabalenka golf match if it comes off? I want Coco, but I think Sabalenka gets her revenge from New York. Okay, all right, and three, three. Th- close, close, cl- very close two or three, and I think the winner of that match wins the tournament. So well, I'll go Sabalenka and Novak. Yeah, I mean, I'm agreeing with you that the winner of that match wins the tournament. I just, I got a feeling that Coco squeaks it out and that she wins the tournament, gets her second major in a row. I, I like the way, I continue to like the way she's carrying herself and the confidence she's displaying, yeah. the self-assurance. And yeah, I still believe that Novak will win the tournament. I, I'm with you on that. I, I think some of it is going to depend on, you know, uh, how how he's feeling. No, it, no, no more recurrence of the of the sore wrist. And the, I mean, and keeping the form up that he showed in the third round and building round by round that encouraged him. But yeah, I mean, come on, he's won this tournament ten times. I think that that the guy with the next best chance to win the tournament, even ahead of Carlos, in my view, is Sinner. And that potentially we get a we could have a a, a scintillating uh, semifinal between Novak and Sinner. Uh, I'd love to see that with the winner potentially playing Alcaraz in the finals. But I would I wouldn't put it past Sinner if he somehow managed to beat Novak to then follow up and beat Carlos in the finals. Uh, I'm not high I'm not high on him right now. Novak is the favorite, but if Sinner were to find a way to stop Novak, I don't think he'd stop there. I think he'd win the tournament and his, and that would be his first slam. We know he's yeah. going to have slams in his future, but so. obviously Novak going for an 11th crown, you know, and going for a 25th major. And, and you know, it just, he, he's so hard to stop the first, the deeper he sinks his teeth into a tournament, the harder he is to beat. A hundred percent. You got these, these, these elite of the elite as they work themselves into a tournament, they just get laser locked in and it just gets harder than it already is to beat these uh these greats and yeah novak to me i think novak something's gonna some odds gonna have to happen for novak to not win this tournament i'll just leave it at that all right there's gonna be a ton of great matches this week i hope everybody enjoys it i know steve and i will be enjoying it and we'll be uh we'll be discussing the the two winners and and some of the most uh fun ladder round matches the next time we're at it thanks again steve thanks david enjoyed it